Hello and welcome to the Museum of Contemporary Photography's Photos at Zoom. My name is Lindley Warren McCunis, and I am one of the curatorial assistants here at the MOCP, as well as an MFA photography candidate here. <laughs> Sorry, there are sirens going by. Um, today our topic is portraiture and the human subject. Um, one of the things that I've really been thinking about in relation to portraiture while I've been preparing for this is representation. And that may seem like the most basic thing when we're thinking about portraiture or the human subject within photography, but I've really been thinking about the way that not only a photograph can represent a human that is in the image, but also how photographers can use a human subject within the photograph to represent themes, ideas, issues in our society. Um, if you're tuning in for the first time for Photos at Zoom, this is something that we're doing every week at when, on Wednesday at noon. Um, and we are having different curators uh, and curatorial assistants run through different topics. And at the end of my talk, I will also um, update you with what will be happening later this week and also next week. I would like to encourage all of you to um, to add questions, uh, we already have one so far. Um, in the chat box, we also have a Q&A uh, thing available, but we do ask you to use the chat box just so it can be more community oriented and everybody can see what the conversations are. Um, yes, you can rewatch the other uh, weekly talks and um, I will ask Kristen if you could please post the link there where they can find those, um, that would be great in the chat box. So um, we will be starting with Julia Margaret Cameron and working our way chronologically to um, a very close to the contemporary moment with portraiture. Um, this portrait by Julia Margaret Cameron became very interesting to me because of the way that it shifted based on real life events. When this photograph was made, she titled it simply Ellen Terry at 16. And this photograph was taken the, the eve before this young woman was married to a mentor of, um, of Cameron's. Uh, his name was George Frederick Watts, George Frederick Watts, and he was actually the first person that Cameron showed photographs to. Um, he was an artist himself and he really encouraged uh, Cameron to look at painters and, and to think about photography as a high, as a high art form. And so, as I mentioned before, um, thinking about the eve of this young woman's marriage to this man um, and, and titling it in a way that it's just her name and her age points to the, the, the impression that Cameron was taking this portrait as a way to show um, who this young woman was. She was a famous Shakespearean actress and um, now now and in, in our times we think wow 16 is extremely young to get married so we could understand her doubt and her fears um the marriage only lasted a few years and it had a hard falling out and so when julia margaret cameron again reprinted this it's a photo gravier, she retitled it sadness and so it with that title, it translates into something that's uh, more allegorical as opposed to just a representation of this young woman. Instead, the young woman becomes a rep representation of sadness. So, so that switches the meaning for the image, for the viewer, and potentially, I'm assuming, for the artist herself. Um, she, she was using the same image, but it, uh, it changed in meaning. Um, something, something also that I was really inspired by, uh, that I've always been very inspired by with Julia Margaret Cameron, is that she was, she was one of the earliest photographers and, and always throughout history, um, luckily things are changing today, but uh, it, it's monumental for a woman um, born in 1815, right, to be an artist and to be really um, at the top of her game. Uh, she, she started photographing when she was nearly 50. It was actually her daughter and son-in-law that bought her a camera. And so it's inspiring to think uh, not only that she was a woman, but that she was later in life when she began her really um, groundbreaking career. Oh, sorry, <laughs> zoom in. Okay. Um, and then we have Alfred Stieglitz, which is also a really important early figure in photography. 
he was really involved in what we know as pictorialism. And this was a movement to really put photo in this position of fine art, very similar to what Cameron was doing with the relationship to painting and thinking about um, how photo can, can have its place in that art world. We uh, can look at this image and we can think about genre scenes, right, that we've seen throughout art history and painting. We see a figure, he's an asphalt paver, but we don't really see any characteristics. It, it's just, um, it's, it's a figure that's a worker and we don't have much information. It's clearly not a representation of this person. We're not up close. We're not seeing um, any kind of details of the face or the personality. And so it becomes a, a, a figure in, in the landscape and in the scene and something that was important in pictorialism is not only that you're, you're showing kind of some kind of genre scene, but also that there's an atmosphere present that there, you know, there's elements that are showing like the fog and the clouds that's very beautiful, that, uh, you know, they would do things like rub oils on the, on the lens to create this very painterly effect. Um, and for those of you who are more familiar with uh, the photo history in general, you know, after this, there was a, a totally different shift to have this, this super, you know, sharp image. Um, to better capture the modern times. And so we also um, see this image here that Stieglitz created with a photographer named Clarence White. And when I was reading about Clarence White, I really felt an affinity with him, um, both within my own practice, but in our, our current uh, moment with COVID-19, because he was somebody, he grew up in rural America and the Midwest in various small towns in Ohio. And he really photographed close to the close to the home. And so he talks about the, the, the pictorial, the pictorialism um, aesthetics that are present in his work, not as uh, just an aesthetic choice, but that they were a result of where he photographed. So he would photograph at um, strange times of the day that, that typically photographers were told not to shoot at. He would photograph within the home. Um, and he was, he was photographing his wife and his children and his wife's sisters. Um, and this is a collaboration between Clarence White and Stieglitz. And it's titled Experiment 27. And there's another uh, photograph as well called Experiment 28, which is not in our collection, but it's again of a woman with this, uh, I'm, I'm presuming glass, uh, this big global ball that um, appears in a lot of Clarence White's photographs. It's this very kind of, uh, you know, fantastical, beautiful object. And he photographs uh, women with it inside the home and also outside of the home within the landscape. And we can see here, even though this isn't the best file ever, um, it's another photo gravure. And uh, again, you know, it's very obscured. We're not seeing the figure's features. And so um, as I was talking about representation again, obviously she is not fully represented, um, but her figure is, is playing in this idea of representation of an aesthetic quality for the pictorialism. Um, Stieglitz was also an important figure, um, not only because he was a photographer, but he was also a curator, a writer, a publisher. He created um, a, a publication which came out quarterly and consisted, consisted of photogravures, um, which sounds quite fancy and lovely. I would, have to, I would love to have a quarterly publication of photogravures sent to me. But, um, and that lasted from 1902 to 1917. And, um, and it was, the, it was the first public uh, outlet for European art in the United States. And so, you know, he's really like, uh, he's doing a lot for photo. You know, he's doing all of the things. Um, and he's involved with pictorialism and then he switches uh, to the, the new aesthetics. You know, he, he was very, always trying to be at the, the cutting edge of, of all of it. Does anybody have any questions before we move on about Cameron or Stieglitz? 
Yeah, so pictorialism, that's interesting. The, the artist's emotion, sure, yeah. So, so they're, they're using aesthetic qualities to, um, to create this. Uh, um, Joan, if you, oh, I don't know why you wouldn't see it. Uh, uh, Michael uh, Prius, I hope I say that correct, um, asked, didn't pictorialism attempt to represent the artist's emotion? Um, and, and yes, I would say that they are definitely using aesthetic qualities to represent their own emotions. Um, and again, that's interesting to think about, right? Because it's, uh, it's the art, the artist projecting their emotions as opposed to trying to capture the subject's emotions. And that's something that, that we'll see throughout the selection of images that I made where the artist is really projecting an idea or their own, um, emo emotions or their own identity, um, into the work and the subjects kind of just become a part of the greater whole of the context. Uh, yeah, Marla, they would put um, oils on the on the lenses to create like a blurry effect. And then here we have James Vanderzee. And James Vanderzee started a commercial photo studio in Harlem in 1916, and it was called the Guarantee Photo Studio. Um, what's really great about uh, his commercial practice, and he had great uh, commercial success through the studio, is that the people would come in and they, they uh, were sitting to be uh, represented as they wanted to be represented and how they wanted to be remembered through photography. But uh, Van Der Zee is not just trying to create like a straight visual record of them. He is using costumes, uh, theatric, th theatric um, aspects, beautiful backdrops, um, visual effects. He would do alterations, which is part of the reason that he was um, so well uh, received and loved in the community is because he would do things like create alterations to create um, cigarette smoke or double exposure to um, put a loved one who, ha who had passed away or some kind of dream aspect within the image. Uh, Julia, I'll get to your question in just a moment. Um, and so uh, Van Der Zee um, was in a very important exhibition in 1916, sorry, 1969, um, that was really important to Dawood Bey, who we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and this exhibition was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And it was really uh, monumental because it was one of the first exhibitions to really be dedicated to a minority group in America. But there, there were still a lot of uh, problems with the, uh, the exhibition. Uh, one of them being that some people felt that um, if they were going to have a show that was uh, dedicated to African Americans in America, that it should also include the more serious arts uh, like sculpture or painting um, and not just like photography, which is like the ugly cousin of the art world, you know? Um, and, and also they felt like they should, uh, the people in Harlem felt like they should have been involved in the selection process of the art because they are the people that, that know uh, Harlem best. Um, so Van Der Zee is a fantastic photographer. Um, unfortunately, in the 30s, uh, he had to close the studio because of economic depression, but he really started to become an important figure in retouching photo, and a lot of people would go to him um, to have his expertise. Um, the sitter's attire uh, is their own, but I, I believe that he also had attire within the studio that they could use. Uh, but but I think people really wore their best, you know, their best clothes um, to to have these portraits made because th again they were how they wanted to be remembered. But yeah, he he definitely had a lot of like uh, he had like full length fur coats in the studio that people could wear. He had um, a lot of jewelry um, and a lot of different props that people could use that that you know they, the items didn't belong to them but they were able to use for their own portraits. Uh, yes, Harlem on my mind. Yes. Um, 
the concept of Yeah, so, so um, Julia asks uh, if I could discuss the concept of portraiture when these photos seem to be using human as a canvas for exercises other than capturing, preser preserving the image um, of subjects. Definitely. Um, we're going to talk a lot about that with the uh, photos that I have coming up. So talking about staging, um, Talking about staging, uh, referencing to the first question, which um, I will read aloud just so uh, we can get to it and not um, overlook it, Hillary, Hillary Johnson, since you also emailed it, um, I wanna make sure to address it. Um, Hillary asks about uh, portraiture within the time of Corona and wondering about um, the setting versus a studio or setup uh, for portrait making and how to determine what is most relevant in the frame versus posture and body language. Um, can you all see me? It seems like something might have happened. Okay, okay, great. Um, thanks, <laughs> Zoom. Um, can, can't see, but can you hear me? Um, uh, okay, I'm going to stop my video and restart it and see if, can you all see me now? <laughs> no, okay. Yes. So, okay, okay, I, th I think we're good. Okay. Um, great. So, um, the question before answering. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I'm going to ask, or I'm going to address Hillary Johnson's question, um, which is about making portraits in the time of Corona and thinking about setting up a, a portrait, thinking about gesture, um, and thinking about what is relevant within the frame. So those, that's, a, that's a big question. Um, and Hillary, if you, um, if towards the end, if I don't address those things that you're asking about, just naturally through talking about it, please repose your question and I will um, be happy to address it. Um, okay, great. Um, so this is Jeff Wall and talking about staged portraiture, um, Jeff Wall is somebody who definitely comes to mind. Um, and again, thinking about people within the frame, but definitely not representing themselves. They, they're really actors. Now, this is Jeff Wall himself. It's called Double Self-Portrait. And towards the beginning of Jeff Wall's career, he was doing uh, just like a couple of self-portraits. And with this one specifically, he's thinking about how to visualize a literary concept. I couldn't find the exact literary concept that he was addressing, but I'm assuming that it's uh, the double by Doistia. Tostiovsky. Um, and <laughs> sorry. Um, but he doesn't really do much self portraiture after this. And uh, I think it's, it's very interesting to see self portraits by Jeff Wall. I, I don't know why, but it seems like maybe because a kind of personality is so removed later, like, because they're so fabricated. Um, if for, for those of you who aren't familiar with Jeff Wall's work, he, he creates these elaborate scenes. Um, a really good example of kind of the, the level of elaboration that he goes to, um, he decided that he wanted to uh, create a scene of people waiting outside a nightclub and he it's it's completely fabricated set but it looks exactly like a normal street where people are just waiting outside of a club and he had all of these studio assistants like chew up gum and put it on the cement um, so it would look real um, and a lot of people kind of question well why wouldn't you just like go buy a nightclub and photograph people waiting outside the club but he, that was his whole idea to like recreate these normal moments and he also has more uh, fantastical images but uh, earlier on he was definitely inspired by um, 
liter literary references and also painterly references. Invisible Man photo is incredible, definitely. Um, and I encourage you all to look at that one specifically. Some of my uh, my peers will use that. Uh, use that. I think Dil Dylan or and or Jordan have used it, um, which are uh, two curatorial assistants, which you will see here on photos at Zoom and other places as well. As well. Um, but uh, nothing too elaborate to say here about Jeff Wall. I just thought it was definitely worth mentioning him um, with relation to uh, setup and, and portraiture. Um, he actually sold the like two, uh, two bits that he um, emerged. I saw them on that, that they had sold in an auction. Um, and you can actually see copies of this photo where you can see the line um, where he merged the two uh, photographs because uh, he doesn't have an identical twin to talk about how this was made. You know, he just, he has the camera, the tripod, stands in one side of the room, takes the photo, and then stands on the other side of the room and takes the photo, and then later composites them so that they're one image. And then here is uh, Dawood Bay, who we, we are very fortunate to have at Columbia College Chicago as a wonderful professor. Um, and I will show one of these Polaroids here from 1993 when the MOCP invited him to come here for an educational outreach program. Um, and he worked with the urban youth and he did workshops with them. Um, and he, he, you know, he had been for a couple of decades photographing on the street. And you look at his portraits and you think they're very intimate and they are, but I, I, uh, I read that he became interested in having these more, um, more intimate sessions with people where he could really sit with them and get to know them instead of just meeting them on the street, briefly taking their photo and moving on. And so with these youth, he's create, he was uh, doing workshops with them and, um, and, and also sitting with them for a long time. And I, I love seeing these Polaroids from 1993, which he, he began making the Polaroids in the mid eighties. Um, but this this is from Chicago, uh, and and you see these, and they're very contemporary, right? I mean, we see this a lot. Uh, I see this a lot with uh, with photographers, young photographers today, um, doing this fragmentation, um, and it's it's a really beautiful way to um, try to capture the human subject in a way that is representing them, uh, because because the slight gestural changes. Hillary, this kind of addresses gesture and framing and what fits within a single frame because uh, Dawood is using several frames, right? These are large format Polaroids. Um, and I read that he also would give the, the negative part of the image because you peel the, the large Polaroid. Uh, he would give those to the subjects and then keep the positive for the work. Um, and we, we see that the slightest uh, facial changes, gestures, timing, um, and we can learn so much about a person through those, those elements that are represented in a photograph. And again, let, let's think about the title, Larry, David, and Jason, right? There's no experiment or the double portrait or, yes, this is in the MOCP collection. Um, definitely. Uh, Hillary says, you can see the passage of time in such an interesting way. It's very true. Um, and I, I think it's lovely to see, um, to see this later work by Dawood after this one, uh, because of, because of the sitting, you know, and the, and this deep intimacy. Uh, now this, this series by Dawood, I, I think I have to say is my favorite, uh, the Birmingham project. And it was made um, nearing the 50th anniversary of the Birmingham bombings um, in 1963 when the KKK bombed the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama, uh, which killed uh, four young black girls and the same day two young black boys were killed, uh, murdered out of racial violence. Um, and so Dawood went to Birmingham and, and worked with people um, within a church and a museum there to uh, photograph people to really pay respect to those lives that were lost. What's fascinating about these portraits is they really strike such a beautiful balance of 
of creating an intimate experience with the subject who is sitting before us. I feel so emotionally connected by their gaze and their body language and this like this presence that I, I can feel um, in the exchange be between Dawood and the sitter. Um, they're both coming together in this moment to think about this monumental day um, that really uh, was so important with the history of the civil rights movement um, and a very mournful day. And, and again, it's, it's titled with their names. Um, and, and the young boy um, is the age of one of the boys that died that day. And then the older man is uh, the, the age that the, the young boy would be um, in 2013. Um, and so there's a 50 year span. And so it, it's such a um, um, emotive and poetic way to talk about uh, of lives lost and the span of time and memory and impact. Um, and, and there's this, this gap, right, of, of, of the ages. Um, but they're just, they're just a, really a, a beautiful combination of, of both intimacy and concept and representation both with the individuals here and acting as surrogates. And then we jump here to tw uh, 2001 with Hannah Starkey. And Hannah Starkey is interesting to look at in this set because um, it goes back to Cameron and Stieglitz with thinking about painting and, and a cinematic quality in, in Starkey's case. Uh, she's really inspired by the painter Edward Hopper. And in her work, she's really thinking about the female perspective and the way that females are represented in photo history and art history as well. Um, and so we often see women uh, in her images that are by themselves, very mundane settings. You know, here we have a kitchen, here we have uh, a cafeteria or a diner. Um, and here we can see that the, this image is untitled and the former is just kitchen, right? So she's not telling us their names. She's not really giving us much information. Um, and usually when a photographer does that, that's because they want the image to kind of carry its own life and they don't want to paint it too much um, by their titling. Um, and so Starkey is really thinking about and trying to subvert the way that we often see uh, females represented in, in photos. You know, we don't see their faces. Um, in Starkey's case, she's kind of creating this like emotive distance and this um, very formal, you know, she has very formal lines, very formal structures, and the women are often, again, like shown by themselves that create kind of this um, isolation. Um, and I think she's, she's a great um, contemporary example of somebody who is, again, um, using the human form, but in a way that it's really not about the individual person and the frame. It is more about kind of a feeling or trying to create um, a, an aesthetic or kind of uh, mood. And then this is actually one of my favorite uh, works in the collection. It's by Taryn Simon, a photographer that I uh, respect tremendously. Um, for this project, she was initially uh, brought to the idea through a New York Times Magazine assignment that she was put on. And what she did is she went around the country and she met people who had been wrongfully ac accused for violent crimes. And they were only set free once there was DNA evidence proving that they were not the, the um, people who committed these crimes. She became very fascinated with the role of photography within the criminal justice system because people can be wrongfully accused based on uh, the the criminal justice system depending on visual memory. But through the process of saying this is the person who did it, there are drawings that are created of um, 
the person who did it based on memory. There are mug shots. There are um, all of this, you know, maybe surveillance footage. You know, there's all of this visual re representation that is presented to the person who is supposed to remember exactly who did it and where they did it. Um, and so through this process of getting new information visually, their memories change and then they wrongfully accuse someone. Um, and um, the huge headlight, yeah, we'll talk about that. Um, and so Taryn Simon went around the country and ex extended this project. She became very, very interested in this, started doing heavy research, going around interviewing people and meeting people. And she began to photograph them in places where uh, the crime either took place or where their alibi had taken place, or you know where they said their, their alibi location was, um, or where they had been arrested. Um, and so sometimes for these photographs, she was meeting the people who had been wrongfully accused in the scene, in the uh, location of the crime where they had never been before. Um, or they had uh, met her where they had been arrested. And all of them are, are extremely um, aesthetically rich. She has these, um, yeah, these huge headlights. Uh, um, in, in the work or, she, you know, she has uh, this really fantastic image of this man like in the mat in between a mattress and uh, they're all very interesting and and I mean talking about n narrative within photography as a whole other talk, but you know, she uses these narrative elements, you know, like um, the question here, how do you interpret that huge headlight in the context of this work. It's very interesting right I mean thinking about a headlight you think about like, um, I mean this is like a very kind of dorky film reference, but think about like Edward Scissorhands, right? Where like he gets he gets caught, like he like was tricked to go into the garage and then the like lights go off, right? We associate like lights with like being um, caught or like or sirens. And so just have to have a like huge light um, coming behind him. We think of like a crime scene, at least I do. Um, and again, this very serious kind of somber figure there and this, this, this darkness surrounding. Um, Taryn Simon is very research heavy in her work, like I mentioned. And um, so she got really deep in, into um, meeting these people. And again, I think it's, uh, it's interesting because again, you know, uh, titling the image with, with the subject's name um, and it is, it is about him, uh, but also it's about larger themes uh, within the criminal justice system and people who are wrongfully accused. Um, and so again, like Dawood's work, I think it has a beautiful blend of um, representation happening on all kinds of levels. Love these comments. All right, um, and so I, I will talk about two um, series here by um, Hivrohe Slovens. Um, hope I said that right, I practiced. Um, and so this, this project is called Partners in Crime. Um, Slovens is a uh, Croatian photographer, but has lived in the United States for quite some time now. And he, he created this series um, uh, in 2006 and 2007, I believe, and he was photographing uh, people who are in same-sex uh, unions, but are were not legally uh, they were not legally allowed to get married at this time, and so he was photographing them in this fashion that um, that is is referencing a 19th century wedding photography, but um, he is. Uh, showing them in this kind of very cold, uh, disconnected fashion where they're not being romantic, you know, they're not touching each other, they're very serious, you know, and, and he asked them to wear clothes that they would want to wear at their wedding. Um, but then there's all of these juxtapos juxtapositions happening. Again, the subject are named in the title, but he's using he's using all of these different same sex couples photographed in a very similar fashion to again talk about um, a larger idea, uh, a larger issue really within the society um, 
about this uh, way that is all, uh, not only like obvious and, and put on people, but also in subtle ways that same-sex couples um, are told that they, they shouldn't be, you know, like uh, walking around with their arms around each other or whatever, because it's like not socially acceptable, um, especially at this time before it was even legal for them to have a legal union, a legal marriage. Um, so uh, for this series, uh, the, they also were uh, people who were in uh, unions for uh, around uh, an average of 18 years. So he's photographing a lot of older couples who had been together, you know, <laughs> longer than some marriages even last. Uh, so it's, it's again pointing out this kind of like silliness to, to not legally allow them to, to marry. And uh, another series by Slovens is, uh, is uh, Croatian Rhapsody. And, and in this series, um, it's a really fantastic series. I encourage you to look it up because there is so much going on. It really becomes a multimedia with video and, and 3D objects. And, um, and I really love talking about this image, especially when it's hanging in the museum. Uh, Teju Cole had it up for uh, Go Down Moses, which we had um, a few months ago now. And uh, what's so fantastic about this specific image is that there's like this unfolding that happens through the process of uh, looking at it. Because a lot of people, um, when I would give tours, we would look at it and I would ask, uh, what do you think is happening in the image? And at first, a lot of people thought that um, it was a protest. And, uh, and then you look at the title uh, and it refers to a church choir. So then you think, oh, they're singing. But the photographer is actually um, kind of toying with you and misleading you because these are all actors who are just looking in the same direction and saying a single word. And so there's, there's all of these layers of like expectation, believing uh, a title um, and, and thinking about these things that we believe and uh, the, the truth and fiction, you know, conversation that exists so heavily throughout photographic history um, and thinking about, are we going to challenge uh, what we're being told or what we're being presented? Um, again, this series is uh, very multi-layered. There's a lot going on, um, and it's kind of, uh, uh, some would say all artists are liars. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> probably. Um, yeah, does anybody have any questions right now that I have not addressed? Let's see. Um, is there anything, uh, Michael says, is there anything in these later portraits that would use to characterize them as contemporary as opposed to say modern? Um, so the, the word modern, right, uh, is, uh, that's another talk too, but it, it's relating to uh, like moder modernity and like, um, you know, modernism and this time in history where uh, everything kind of switched to this very uh, straightforward, clean kind of aesthetic. Um, and, and they are, they are um, often interchangeable, modern and contemporary. People, people do interchange them. Um, but contemporary uh, is a term that I like to use because it's not tied to that, that history. Um, and so, you know, talking about the contemporary moment, so I think of like the last 40 years when I used the term contemporary. Um, what is the name of the exhibit project that includes this image? So the exhibit, there have been two ex exhibitions of this work. There was a three person exhibition that Kristen, if you could post the name of that one, that'd be great. Um, that Slovens was part of, but then this image itself was part of Teju Cole's exhibition um, from last year called Go Down Moses. And then um, the, uh, thank you, Kristen. And then the series is called Croatian Rhapsody. Um, and then here we have Myra Green, 
Uh, this this uh, image as well was in Teju Cole's Go Down Moses, and it was displayed very beautifully um, in the center of the room. So it really um, captured your attention. Um, I'm assuming we have installation shots of that, and and hopefully a lot of you got to see that exhibition. Uh, but really, I think that was there were a lot of striking um, installation things happening in that exhibition. Uh, but this was one that it was just in the center of the room with a lot of space around it where um, her eyes just really, really looked at you. Um, Myra Green is um, using a, a wet plate process, um, which is referenced in, or is part of the history of uh, colonialism and slavery and uh, ethnographic photography. Um, and she talks about, these are self-portraits, and she talks about photographing the features of herself that are um, the features of race. She's photographing her nose, her eyes, her ears, her mouth. Um, and it's so beautiful the way that she does this uh, because she's, she is using black glass for the material um, instead of transparent glass. And when it's tran transparent, gla transparent glass, you can reproduce it as many times as you want, right? But if it's, if it's a positive image, uh, it, it doesn't. And, and that's really um, conceptually striking to me because uh, it's, it's speaking to this, um, this way that she is acting uh, as a stand-in for this entire history. Um, but she is the photographer and she is the subject and she's staring right at us. And she is also saying, this is an individual, right? Like the fact that you cannot reproduce the image, it is an individual image and she is an individual. Um, and so I think it's a really beautiful way um, to, to make this concept and this, um, execution of the concept really come together um, in a really powerful way. Um, yeah, Mimosa, definitely. Um, that's, that's something that's so fantastic about it as well as um, the series is from 2007, but uh, it, it really, again, not only conceptually refers to an earlier time, but aesthetically you see these and you do not think 2007. Uh, which again just speaks to her. Um, no, uh, they are actually much smaller. Um, it, I'm sure, thank you so much, Kristen. She's always on top of it. <laughs> yeah, so they're small, you know, they're like, a, I don't know if you've seen a glass glass plate negative before, but they're, they're even small, you know, some glass plate negatives are bigger than uh, what she uses, but um, they're small and they're, they're just beautiful, um, very intimate. Yeah. Um, and then we have a series here from Lawrence Rosti. Um, her parents are from Iran, but she grew up in Switzerland. And in 2007, the, the president of Iran was in America and made a comment that uh, uh, while he was speaking at Columbia University um, and said, unlike you, we don't have homosexuals in Iran which obviously is not true. Um, it's just that to be a homosexual in Iran is punishable by death. Um, and so you have to completely hide the fact uh, if you are a homosexual there. And so um, Rasti began to photograph people who left the country um, to live elsewhere. And she photographed them in a Turkish town that a lot of people would travel through to um, get out of Iran to go to other places of the world to live so that they could live freely. Um, I really appreciate the way that Rosti uses um, aesthetic qualities to talk about this, this um, desire to be yourself. The, the, the subject is meeting our gaze, uh, which is, which is, which is uh, to me, a welcome invitation to connect, right? If somebody is meeting your gaze um, in, in a photograph, it, it's a lot more connective, as I referred to earlier. But again, they are hidden behind this object, um, showing this this idea that they, they cannot reveal themselves fully, that they are not allowed to. Um, again, we see another aesthetic choice. We see uh, the standing light. We see these uh, fake flowers. 
and other objects showing us again that um, these identities need to be hidden. Now, I love having this image as well um, in the same set as Sloven's work, which is also about um, needing to hide identity if you are living as a, within a same-sex union, uh, because uh that that series that slovens did you know was photographed here in america um and it shows like the worldwide parallels of needing to um hide that identity hmm. And then we have uh, Natalie Crick here, who is a graduate of uh, the program at Columbia College Chicago. And um, I, I've always loved this series. And it's unfortunate that um, you can't see it in person. Uh, Kristen, Kristen Taylor and I were talking about this. And Kristen's like, you have to talk about the glossy paper. And I was like, I know, uh, because it's it's such a nice element of Natalie's work because uh, it's so, it's high gloss paper and you see it in person and not not very many photographers use that high gloss paper, um, so it adds another element of like having this conversation with high gloss magazines and commercialism, um, and so Natalie is photographing. Um, herself, her sister, her mother, sometimes her grandparents, in other work she's photographing, older women and other women in general. Um, but I love this, uh, this way that she photographs, you know, the legs and you can see the varicose veins and you can see the scratch on the leg and you can see uh, like this combination of like the natural and the fake, you know, and, and this blending together of like uh, mother and daughter and, uh, it's just, there's so much going on here that's so fantastic. Um, and I, again, you know, I just love this idea of self portraiture and photographing her mother and photographing people who are very close to her, but they are, they're acting, you know, they're, they're uh, performing for the camera. Um, and I'm so happy we have such a fantastic file of this image. Um, you know, the use of color is really profound. And I, I think her mother's gaze is just so striking. It just like is right there in your face. Um, and that flash is fantastic. Um, and the, uh, yeah, and I'm sorry, I'm hoping that the names and the titles of things are showing up next to the image as well on the presentation for those of you who have questions about um, the names and series and so forth. Okay, thanks, Joan. Um, and and so again, you know, uh, I this is another artist. I mean, I encourage you to look up all of these artists, um, which will we will have a list. And this video also is being recorded, so it will be posted um, later if you want to refer back to it. Um, but using these visual techniques that are present in commercial photography um, or high gloss magazines of like bright colors, lots of makeup, lots of artificial light, you know, but, but again, making that very uh, conscious decision not to um, hide a scar on the face or a wrinkle on the face or a scratch on the leg. Um, and again, this merging of mother and daughter is, you know, speaking to the ways that uh, we're taught, right? We're taught to uh, wear our makeup a certain way or uh, either by our like maternal figures or by society or by those magazines that she's aesthetically referencing, you know? So um, again, just a fantastic way of playing with representation. Um, and I'm happy to see we're doing pretty well on time. Um, we have about 10 minutes left and this is the last artist. So um, I will talk about Priya's work and then please feel free to ask um, any questions and it will be super easy for me to like flip back or answer a couple questions uh, before we wrap this up. So this is Priya Cambly. Um, she will be um, added to our collection soon. It's going through the acquisition process, uh, which is very exciting. And um, in her work, she is talking about blending together two cultures. So when she was 18, she uh, moved to the United States to study. And um, 
she grew up in India and so she's taking these photographs of her family members as well as materials and objects from India. Like here we can see the patterned paper um, and she is digitally compositing them with photographs um, in a way that really focuses our attention on specific, uh, Hillary, this goes back to your question, gestures, right? She repeats gestures by uh, doubling this woman, by using the paper around the mouth so that our eyes go there, um, covering certain things and leaving other things present. So we just look at the hands, you know, even the title, fitted hands. What does she want us to look at? The hands. And so we go there with her. Um, and it's just a beautiful way to uh, work with material and create this really multi-layered experience of thinking about the past and the present and multiple cultures and family. Um, and while these uh, do, not, do not show uh, um, all of the breadth of her work um, where she is also um, photographing herself in gestures and and clothes as well like that her mother wore um, we are again seeing um, what what she wants us to see through fr framing techniques that are um, very uh, conceptual and material and um, I heard a rumor that Priya may be watching so uh, there's a question uh, She's placing flour on top of the images. Thank you, Kristen. Um, and Priya, if you're here, if you want to say anything as well, please, I'm sure people would be happy to hear from you. Um, but so flour on the images and uh, pattern paper, I believe. And um, using, using this way that we see, um, oh yes, thank you, Kristen. So Priya, Priya will be giving um, a tour of her video, or sorry, of her, studio on video next Friday. So I'm definitely watching that one. You should too. Um, and you can learn a lot more about her work um, and what she's thinking about. And um, yes, flower on top. That's fantastic. Um, so yes. Okay, Priya, that's fantastic. I'm so excited to watch that. Um, and so, uh, since Priya is talk talking soon and we only have a few minutes left, um, I will leave all of the beautiful insights to her um, for next Friday. And I will tell you now about um, the events that we have coming up. Um, our next photos at, photos at Zoom is going to be uh, next week, uh, Socially Engaged Photography with Dylan Yarbrough. That will be next Wednesday, 12 to 1. And then this Friday, we have a Behind the Lens with uh, Ross Sawyers, who is a professor of photography as well um, at Columbia College Chicago. Um, and that will, um, that will be wonderful to see his studio and how he's working and fabricating these images. Um, and then uh, the one that we were just talking about, Behind the Lens with Priya, um, next Friday, May 8th from 12 to 1. Um, thank you, Karen. Um, so download the PDF and learn more. <laughs> uh, here's the link. We have so many uh, fantastic um, events uh, coming up. I have been so impressed with the curators and the education team at uh, MOCP for putting all of these amazing uh, presentations together. Um, there's so much to look forward to. And um, thank you all so much. Um, I really appreciated uh, doing this today. Um. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Take care.